October 2nd, 2013. I am your host, Chris Wong, and um, your regular host, uh, Mr. Matt Gradwell, had to bail today, so it's the three of us. Um, with me, I've got Scott Meek. Hi, guys. Hi, Scott. Not too bad. How much stuff, Chris? Doing just great. I'm staying sane, barely. <laughs> Our special guest today is uh, Mr. Shannon Rogers. He is the Renaissance woodworker in the Handful of School of Fame, and uh, one of the greatest handful woodworkers of our generation. <laughs> yeah, now you have some more credibility for that. <laughs> hey, you have good taste in planes. I know that. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I'm supposed to have all of my Scott Meek planes like laying about, like in piles of shavings and things. Yeah, that's why I'm on the board. <laughs> that was last time. Last time, okay. So, what are you doing today, Shannon? Um, I'm building that that, that, that chuttle lathe back there. there. Um, oh, yeah. I strung up the belt earlier. Uh, it's one of those. It's a little frustrating build because every little tweak I have to make, I have to disassemble stuff, make that little yeah. tweak, we'll put it back together. And because it's because such, it's a, such a, a precision machine, it's, um, it's um, you you just can't you, you can't make a you know, kind of put it halfway back together and test it because you need something out of line, you know, it'll tweak, it'll uh, bind on you or something. So. Making one little like belt adjustment takes 20 minutes to get it assembled. You make the adjustment, 20 minutes to disassemble it so you can take everything apart. Make the little adjustment and put it back in. If you're not right, if you do it, do it three times. Suddenly three hours is gone. So um, I had just pulled the belt off about an hour ago, and uh, now I've got to do things like start draw boring the joints and putting it all permanently together. But it's, uh, it's essentially done, and it's, uh, it rocks. I like it a lot. It it rocks as in it's very good, or is it rocks as in it's kind of rocky? At least you didn't say it rolls. Yeah. Um, Shannon, or Shannon and Scott, are you guys hearing an echo? Yeah, a little bit. Echo. Um, uh, it's probably from mine. I've got. I just turned my. Turn my speakers. How's that there? I've still got an echo right now, and is that better? I'm not hearing better. much echo from you. Okay, I think it's coming from there. mine. I'm watching my yeah. my uh, volume. There. Okay, it's turning the gain back on my microphone. That might have been it too. Okay, we'll blame it on Matt. Yeah, it's a super sensitive microphone. It's an official wood chat yeah. or uh, wood talk microphone. So perfect. Okay. So today, today on the show, we're going to have Shannon embarrass us in hand tool abilities here. <laughs> um, Woodworking America is only a few weeks away, and we're going to demonstrate some of the activities, some of the events for the Hand to Olympics. Now, um, Shannon, why don't you walk us through the events? Tell us what we have, what we have to do. All right. It is. Um, it takes place in, in two days. There's uh, three events each day. You can only do uh, the three events they have for each one of those days. Set up and things on the organizer's part. Um, so they, you don't have to do all six of them. You can kind of drop in and do whatever, but it's kind of encouraged to do that. Um, so generally the first event is uh, they've got all kind of the fancy witty names to them that I don't remember any of them now. But first one is ripping. Uh, they have a, a 24 inch long piece of four quarter pine. Actually, it's not even, I don't even think it's four quarter. I think it's from the home center. It's S4S, probably three quarter mm -hmm. inch pine. So super yep. soft, super thin. You can rip through it in seconds. Um, pretty sure it's 24 inches. Maybe it's 36. I don't remember now. Um, okay. uh, Mike seems and organizes it has these kind of special saw benches that essentially clamp the board in place. So it's even easier because there's you don't even have to hold it down with your knee. It's clamped in place. So you rip that and then you, you need to go joint it. Um, they provide obviously the tools and everything. So they give you a typical 26 inch mm -hmm. rip saw. This is a crosscut saw, but you get the idea. Um, and then you joint it, and Veritas provides a uh, one of their number seven bevel up joiners. Um, that's the second event, jointing the board. And then third event is, I think, uh, 
well, it doesn't really matter, but mortise and tenon, you cut a tenon, um, and they have this little jig that basically is like an open-ended mortise that they use to judge it against. So after you finish each one of the events, they, they judge, you know, how straight was your cut, how plumb was your cut, and they've got a straight edge they set up against it, and they measure it based upon the number of playing cards they can stick into the gaps, and then the time that it took you to do it. There's this complex computer algorithm that Mike Simpson's son developed that spits out some number, but I still don't understand how it works. As far as I'm concerned, the whole thing could be rigged. You would never know. It's like the BCS. Mm. You have no clue how the points work. It just kind of happens when somebody goes to a bowl. So... The jointing one, they do the same thing. They hold the straight up against, straight edge up against it, and how many playing cards can, can they put in? And then the the tenon is actually pretty cool because they they can fit playing cards almost entirely around the um, the the tenon cheeks as well as the tenon shoulders to be uh, able to determine how square was your shoulder and how you know accurate a fit was the cheek. Then the fourth event on the next day is. Um, uh, boring, and in previous years they've given you a typical uh, twist auger bit with a lead screw, and it's just a matter of how fast can you do it and how square can you do it. And they've got another little jig that they pop in the hole. I believe it's a three-quarter inch hole. Um, they pop that jig in the hole and they put playing cards in to see how plumb that cut was and compare that against time. And then um, what's after that? Dovetailing, I know, was one of them. Yes. Uh, what am I, I think you got them all. Uh, cross cut a board. Cross cut a board. Oh, cross cutting. Yeah, that's the other one. Um, and that's just again how square is yeah. it? And they put the playing cards in. The one twist. Ah, literally, that's a joke. The twist this year mm -hmm. is that instead of there being twist augers, they're using spoon bits. So um, it's going to be interesting mm -hmm. how they do that because the spoon bit. Really, one of the advantages of the spoon bit is you can steer the cut, and you can you know make all kinds of angles uh, okay. with it. Uh, the only thing I figure is that ups the uh, mm. difficulty a little bit because it's, it doesn't just kind of go on autopilot and drill through square. So um, I happen to have it, uh, yeah. a couple spoon bits that I just got sharpened up now, so I figured I would demonstrate that mm -hmm. tonight. They're, they're really fun to work with. They actually cut pretty fast. Uh, the big yeah. difference is obviously there's mm -hmm. no lead screw to pull it through the woods. You have to apply the pressure yourself. Um, now, one thing I've wondered, Shannon, and you're the perfect guy to ask as a left hand, a left hander. Can you use a spoon bit the other direction and still drill? Absolutely. You can. In fact, okay. the, the way to start it is to well, I mean, there's everybody's gonna, it's just like sharpening. Everybody's going to tell you 20 different ways to do it. But the mm -hmm. way I was always taught is you um, you set the bit on the wood and you turn uh, one direction first about I don't know 180 degrees and then you go the other direction 180 degrees. And what that does is kind of okay. set the bit in place because, you know, it's just a semi-circular, got terrible lighting here, sorry, I'm backlit. Um, it's just a, it's a spoon, it's a semi-circular bit to it. So the cutting mm -hmm. edges are lit all the way around it. So you can go whatever right. direction you want. There's no reverse or forward or anything. And This is a spoon bit here. You can see a sharpened edge all the, around, all the way around the perimeter, yeah, right up exactly. the sides of the bit too. Yeah, I've got a... A bigger one here. Just curious. Um, you know when you buy router bits or something like that, and it comes with that like waxy coating that it was dipped in to protect the edges. Do you guys ever keep that? No. I've no. taken to doing this with my spoon bits. No. The little protective coating that they came with, I just cut a slit mm -hmm. down the back, and it's like a perfect sleeve to hold it in. Clever. I think it actually keeps them from rusting. Hmm. Uh, there's my, I've my thought, about it, thought about it, but I've never, never actually kept them. Yeah, well, I attempted it, and they didn't stick around very long. <laughs> probably what it is is I don't have a dedicated space to really keep my spoon bits at this point because they're, <clears> I've only <throat> had them about, I don't know, three months or so, and I haven't really figured out where I'm going to stick mm -hmm. them. I'm out of space. Okay. Anyway... <laughs> Well, my so, thought so. was, um, instead of this being the me show, um, you know, each of us can kind of take an event and kind of walk through it. Because the idea is, is not, um, as Chris said earlier, not to embarrass people, but uh, this is how it is at the, at the show. It's kind of everybody come, show up. If you've never cut a dovetail before, it's a phenomenal place to learn to do it because you've got guys that really know what they're doing. 
Um, you know, and, and many of the quote celebrities at the show will stop by and kind of give tips and things. So if right, you right. go find and kind of leave your ego at the door, you can learn a lot. And oh, yeah. you know, there's, there's a fair amount of good natured ribbing and trash talking, but I think they have um, the, the, what shall we say, the common sense enough. If somebody's obviously a little shy, they're not going to sit there and trash talk you. You know, they'll be polite at that point. If I show up, they trash talk me to no end because they want me to feel it. So, and that's fine. You know, nine, times, nine times out of ten, uh, you may cut incredible dovetails in your shop and you will cut the ugliest looking things in the world there. And pressure and you're supposed to go as fast as you can. And yeah, it's. There's a totally different thing between like speed sawing and accurate sawing. So um, what I'm always trying to tell people is just have fun with it. Don't worry about it being you know a perfect cut or whatever. But it is a great place to um, to learn stuff like that. So yeah. I had I had fun doing the Olympics last year in Pasadena. And uh, the the MWA had a webcam set up. Over the hand to Olympics booth, so they're actually broadcasting uh, the, our performances uh, on air, uh, live. I guess it was streaming. Um, so that was fun. Um, got got a little bit of publicity from that. Uh, I remember. <laughs> I remember that they were th they were going to send a, a film crew over there because there was some dancing going on over in the in the booth. Yeah. And I had fun with the dovetails as well. Um, it was a chance for me to just, I don't know, I just, I just had fun with it. Didn't take it too seriously. That's how it should be, you know? It's not yeah, supposed to be, well. It's not supposed to be work. So some of the guys were, were just serious. They wanted to get the best score, the best performance. Uh, I th um, Nick Rouleau did a face-off with, I can't remember who did a face-off with. There was, we had two, two woodworkers doing head-to-head -head cutting a dovetail. And that was kind of fun to watch. And they both did a really good job. So if, if you're a hardcore woodworker and you've been practicing your dovetails, that's a great, a great fun experience and a good opportunity to show off your skills. But if you just, just want to learn and have fun, it's a great opportunity for that, too. Agreed. Absolutely. Let's cut some stuff. Okay. So who's going to do what, Shannon? I'll do the ripping and the jointing. Yeah. Um, so I guess uh, I've got a... A board here and crosscut saw, so I'll crosscut a board. I'll certainly do the the boring part because I have the spoon bits. And uh, Scott, I think you were the brave one that actually volunteered to do dovetails. Okay. And uh, we can so, arm wrestle for the tenon if you like. I'll do a twist to tenon. No, I won't. Um, <laughs> nice. So, yeah. How much time <laughs> do we have? Yeah. So are we just gonna all three of us just gonna go do it at the same time and try and uh, pay attention to each other or? Ooh, I don't know. <laughs> I was. No, probably just I, I, the time, so everybody can focus on okay. that. Okay. I was gonna. I was gonna try a jigsaw first, and then go to a jointer and see how my speed is versus a hand tool because it'll be actually pretty close. <laughs> sure. Why not? So, who wants to go first? I'm here. I'll go. Scott, ready? Cannon's ready. Okay. I I'm still trying to get rid of echo on my mic, but it's picking up no matter. I've got my speakers pointed the other way, and yeah. the camera pointed down. It's not helping. See if I can get into stalling position here. That's freaking good. picking up everything. Great. All right. <clears throat> so, like the ripping event, they actually clamp the board to the saw bench, but it is a saw bench very much like this. Um, you know, there's a couple different heights as well. So you're looking for a saw bench that's at about knee height. Um, I don't know. This doesn't have to be instruction, but um, I always put my my opposite knee. I'm sawing with my left hand, so I put my right knee on the board. But I take my left knee and put it right behind my cut. So actually, I'm holding the board down with my right knee, and I'm preventing the board from sliding back with my left knee which is nice and everything, but what that really does is it lines up your body. Um, you guys can't see anything above my uh, knee, can you? Um, it lines up your shoulder so that your shoulder's kind of in line with the cut. 
and you end up with a straight cut, ideally. So, I don't know. We don't have to time any of this, do we? So yeah, just pull the back grad wall. So that was about 12 seconds there, Shannon. That was pretty good. Oh, yeah. Except for that uh, so, rocky start. So what I would want to do, and of course I didn't joint the edge of this, but what I would want to do is then take the square and hold it up and see, ta-da, wow. it's square. Looks, looks pretty good to me there. Now is it plumb? I'm pretty sure I went out of plumb with that cut. I'm a little bit... Probably can't see it okay. there. Well, I can I can see that. Yeah, there's a little bit of a gap right by the actual the handle mm -hmm. of the square, but that's pretty dang mm -hmm. close. Okay, um, so is that is that how the event scored, or is there further work you get to do to that joint? Uh, no, that's that the the event is scored just like that. So what okay. they do is they've got a board like a piece of plywood with a flat edge on the bottom and a flat edge square to it, and they stick it in the inside corner. And they stick playing cards in. Okay. And of course, mm -hmm. if the, the board is out of plumb, you'll be able to slide playing cards in this mm -hmm. way. If it's you know not square, you'll be able to slide some in as well. So I think mm -hmm. generally the board they, they start you with has has at least a jointed edge on it. I mean, this is just a factory milled edge, but uh, mm -hmm. um, and that again is pine. This is basswood. I didn't have any pine in the shop, but basswood's mm -hmm. pretty dang soft, so I went with it. Yeah. Okay. So, Good demo. So. That was 12 seconds for, what was that, an 8 inch, eight inch rip? Um, or cross cut, rather? I think it's 9 inches. 9 inches? Yeah, it's a 9 okay. inch. Okay. So Yay! It's... I'm winning. Good job, Shannon. <laughs> hey, so, uh, question. I changed, yeah. um, I changed the mic from my camera mic to my computer mic. Can people still hear me? Yeah. Yeah, sounds right. good. Good. Now... Scott, how long does the dovetail take you? Will this be about a 15-minute thing, or should I do my ripping at the same time, or? Uh, okay, Scott started and come back. <laughs> what am, am I doing half blind or am I doing full through? Does it matter? We want, we want full, full, full blind dovetails. Box wedged. <laughs> oh, full blind dovetail. <laughs> In lignum. <laughs> um, let's take, yeah, let's I take can a pull. Okay. We're gonna take a poll right here. <laughs> Who votes for if, if someone wants to start the start the timer. Okay, I got it. Um. <laughs> All right. Can can everyone see that I'm working right Looks here? Good. I don't know if the cameras. Can to me. All right. Nice mox advice. Thank you. That's a very narrow looking bench there, Scott. It is a very narrow bench. This is my new travel bench. Oh, okay. oh I was going to ask if you had gotten that built already. Yep. So the legs drop off? They're bolted on or something? or? Uh, yeah, I've just got some, some heavy-duty screws. Uh, so there's screws through the tenons into the top. Um, the legs are... Um, they're, are half-lapped onto the legs. Or the, the rails are half lapped onto the legs and screws just hold those on. And so it can all come apart. This will be what I take to to woodworking shows. That's much more refined than the planing beam we had, Chris. Yeah, but it kind of lacks some of the, I don't know, the je ne sais quoi, the improvised. <laughs> <laughs> That was, that was um, show on-site ingenuity. That's all. Yes, that was. A couple, a couple F clamps, and I remember chopping a mortise, standing on top of your bench, chopping a mortise. I think. Right. Brought in the crowds. It's a pretty wide board you got there, Scott. How wide is it supposed to be? It's what I had in my squeeze uh, tube. Two dovetails into that, what, six inch wide board? That'll be all right. All right. <laughs> it's what I had in my scrap bin. 
Um, let's give it, hand it, hand it to Chris and let him rip it first. Yes. Oh, that's, that's a good idea. Just open that wormhole and pass it through. What? <laughs> I haven't gotten my wormhole yet. This whole government I shutdown has. It, I haven't gotten my wormhole delivered to the government shutdown. Alright. You know, I'm not going to put a. I'm going to regret it, but I'm not going to put a little whip on there. I don't have any hold fast uh, holes in this yet, or a hold fast. I, I went to order a hold fast. It's some irony that you have a Lee Nielsen rabbit block plane and I have a Scott Meats block plane. What's up with that? Um, I have a Scott Meats block plane, but it, it doesn't grab it like that one does. Mm. Sounds like a bad design to me. <laughs> so, so Scott's taking the time to lay out his dovetails with the divider to get even spacing across there. Yeah, you won't want to do that at the event. <laughs> wow, fancy. He's going for aesthetics here. Yeah, yeah. This is, this is apparently Shit. how not to do it. I haven't done my own yet. I did what, last year. The, I had uh, a... What are the things that they're looking for? Um, a tight fit. You're looking for tight fit. Um, no cards between the tail and the pin board. That's all that matters. So you can over, you can extend your cuts well beyond the scribe line. Then your angle doesn't have to be the same either. I just eyeballed it the last time. Yeah. I just yeah. Yeah. some tails on a board and moved. <laughs> so. On my blog, there is a uh, a video of the dovetailing performance that I did uh, at the Hanto Olympics. It's about it's a nine minute video. It's I don't know. I think it's pretty hilarious. I tried some very unconventional techniques. Oh yeah, Scott's got the skills there. What do you figure that is, Shannon? Maybe uh, 11, 11 points off? Going pretty quick. 12? 14, maybe? 14? Bad axe, baby. Nice. How many, how, how many teeth per inch, Scott? Um, 14, I think. 14? Aw. Oh. See, Shannon just embarrassed me there. <laughs> I think I have the same saw, so to be fair. Uh, okay. <laughs> You know, they provide a fret saw now, too, don't they? Yes. No. The very first year they did this, they didn't have that. Enough people complained. Mm. Which is good, because I didn't used to bother with a fret saw back then, and I my technique has changed to use them now. Yeah, yeah. Things on chiselware. Yeah, it does make it quick, too. Especially um, for the pin boards. Yeah. I don't even use a mallet anymore because you just like cut nope. right the line and tear it away. Wow. <laughs> I, I cut a set of dovetails um, last week at the joinery seminar I taught, and I was I was playing around with using a really coarse saw, and I was able to just, to just tear out the waste with that coarse saw. So I did like, I did like with a hat with a table saw where you just step over and you keep sawing out your waste. That's all I did. No chiseling required. Not the prettiest joint, but. I can tell right now I've got to do some work on my moxing boards. It's really it's a sloppy moxing and my my screws um, I made the hole in the front uh, piece of the moxing here too too wide yeah. and so they're sloppy so I put some tape around them to, to okay. tighten it up a little bit. Yeah, you, you, want, you want the holes the same diameter as the threads, but they can be elongated so you can taper the jaw or rack the jaw, I guess. Yeah. That's the ghetto fabulous way of doing it. When you it blue tape it. <laughs> Once yeah. you put glue on it, it all melts together into one, right? Hey, my, my <laughs> background is uh, trim carpentry, so. Whatever works.
See, this is going to come back to bite him when he has to cut out those monstrous pins. <laughs> yeah. So you're saying I should have researched what I was doing before I started. What? What fun is that? Can you actually use the top of that Moxon vice as, like a, as a work surface almost, though? Yeah. The jaw and the back are, are on the same level, right? Yeah. Mm. That's pretty cool. Okay. So you can Re see relatively. Chopping you need to. Right, because he drills his holes elongated or oversized. Ah. That wasn't good. You cut yourself? I don't know yet. I'm not bleeding yet. Welcome Jeez. to the Whitwright shop. <laughs> <laughs> if, if, I, if there's blood coming out of my chest all of a sudden, I'm dripping. Let me know. Yeah. <laughs> I, don't, I don't see a hole in my vest. Yes, this is how not to cut dovetails at the Olympics with Scott Meek. <laughs> Alright. So, Shannon, for someone to participate, do they have to sign up ahead of time, or can they sign up when they get to Woodworking in America? Just show up. Just Don't show up. up. So show up on the day of. Yeah, just walk over to the booth and say, I want to compete. Actually, right. knowing how it usually is, um, it's, it's, um, Mike Seamson organizes it, and he's usually got members of the Society of American Period Furniture Makers working the booth with him. So, um, they're pretty good at kind of uh, sucking people in. So yes. If, if you walk, it's usually in the back corner of the marketplace. If you walk that corner, you can expect to be encouraged to participate. So, uh, you know, the, there's very little formality. You show up, you do an event, you give them a name so they can obviously record your, um, your scores. Um, but, you know, one thing we're not mentioning is there are prizes, good ones. Yes. It's all the tools that you use, they give them away. So if yep. you win the jointing event, you get a Veritas jointer. Um, and then they have, I want to say there's like two, they give away two of the tools per event, like one to the winner and one to just some randomly drawn name who participated. So you can win just for showing up. Um, and then they, they give a drawing Whoa. every hour. Like I won um, an Adam Caribbean DVD set a couple years ago, and I won a, a Christopher Schwartz book like the next day. It's basically like just about every exhibitor in the marketplace says, yeah, here, here's some swag. Give it away. Cool. So, um, there's a good chance you can win stuff. I think I just hurt my shoulder pulling this out from behind me here. This is one of the prizes you could win here. Oh, wow. There you go. So that's, assuming it's the same as last year, uh, the Veritas low angle jointer there. Yeah. Yeah, it is. I should have thought about that. I would have put something into the... Uh... Into the prize pool. It may not be too big. Mm. Yeah, that one's going to be sloppy. Courtesy of Scott Meeks, you can win a 14 tooth print bad axe saw. Out of my cold, dead fingers, you can find this saw. <laughs> Maybe that band saw behind him. Yeah, I'm not giving that up either. <laughs> One Scott Meat traveling workbench. <laughs> There's a thought. Yeah, see, they didn't even carry Ooh, that was close. I didn't mark my waist. Ooh, yes, you gotta mark your waist. <laughs> You know, Shannon, if we do this again, we should have everybody cut dovetails at the same time. That'd be kind of fun. Sure, why not? Can you imagine the cacophony that would make? Yeah, it'd be interesting. Well, I, t I taught a hand tool seminar at Reed Valley last week, and it was interesting having six hand saws going at the same time. It was kind of unusual to hear that. It was nice, though. All right, bang those together. Oh, you're going to trim it? Jeez. Big hammer. Doesn't come together right from the saw? What's the problem? Not from the uh, that saw. I don't have one of them fancy. Uh... Oh, you don't have one of those? New concepts? Jeez. 
You know, their, their coping saw is really nice. Shannon, have you seen the coping saw? I've seen it. I've never never used it, though. I have the fret saw. Okay, th there's the fret saw that everybody knows. Yeah. It's got the quick release tension there, and the blade rotates 45 degrees each way. The coping saw is a good bit bigger. It's coping saw, wow. fret saw. Wow, the beast. And what's really cool about it is, I don't know how, this, how well this pick up, but there are ball detents, eight of them yeah. around the mount. So you press it in, and you can turn the mount in 22.5, or I guess 45 degree increments. You can turn it all the way around. It. So you can have it pointed up if you want, or at 90 degrees, or 135, or 45. I find that to be really useful. Longer blades, too, for bigger work. I find that I use the coping saw a lot. Um, the fret saw you use not so much anymore. Did we lose Scott? I think I lost Scott. Mm, I think he's embarrassed. <laughs> I think we'll get him back. Um, maybe I'll... He froze and may have Start doing him. a rip. He'll, he'll, probably, he'll probably come back here. Um, well, so I am doing ripping and jointing. So, you know, one thing we should mention about the dovetail thing is they only give you a half inch chisel. So that's one of those things you have to be uh, creative layout. Right. Um, so if you lay out a, a gap between your tails that's narrower mm -hmm. than a half inch, you're kind of screwed. So that's um, if you don't know how to lay out dovetails using mm -hmm. a chisel, it's a good idea to learn how to do that. That's a good idea. Of course, I'll show you at the at the um, event too if you yes. aren't aware of how to do that. Yeah, you could do a practice, and then you can do your real one. Okay, so while we wait for Scott to come back, um, I will head over to my saw bench, and I am doing the ripping task. So I've got a 40-inch long cedar board, it's a cedar fence board, about three-quarter inch thick, and I am going to rip off one inch of that, drop it in my vise, and then I will uh, joint it. So let me just make sure we can get Scott back into the show here. Okay, Scott, you've got an invite again there. That should be good. And is the echo still good? Yeah, it's not bad at all. Okay, I'm going to turn my volume up a little bit so I can hear you across the shop, and I'm headed over to the bench. So I've got my fancy saw bench here with a cedar board strap to it. I need a square and a pencil to mark my lines to this here. Okay, there's my layout. I've been dying to use this saw. This is a saw that I actually retoothed. It's a uh, let me turn the microphone towards me. Maybe that'll help. I can hear you just fine. All right. Okay. Um, this is a four-point ring. Hey, got back. Stupid charter. The internet goes out every day. Okay. So I'm clear of my bench. I'm not going to cut my bench in half. And yeah, you're talking to me, okay? Got it? Yeah. You're timing me. Okay, here goes.
He's loud. <laughs> it's so good to hear a joiner being used appropriately. Instead of a joiner being used to take thousands of an inch shavings. <laughs> a nice hearty growl from a you know a one sixteenth inch shaving coming out of a joiner. That's what it's supposed to be used. That's right. Even then my wood planes don't make that much racket. <laughs> Oh, I, I muted Chris. I think he's got to unmute himself. <laughs> I was going to say, now he just went whisper quiet. <laughs> Sorry, Chris. I didn't realize it muted him fully. That was just for me. Okay, got it. <laughs> we have the power to mute other people. I like that. Yeah. I so, say, Chris, it sounds like that saw needs to be sharpened. Uh, okay, well... Here's the deal. I retooth that saw at a sharpening event that I did at Lee Valley a while ago. And I took it from a crosscut saw, like an eight point crosscut, to a four point rip. And I filed the teeth in, then I took my saw set, uh, like the pliers type saw set, and set the teeth for a four point saw. And it gave me a curve of about one eighth of an inch or more. It was insane. Good lord. So I took a hammer and I pounded out the set. I pounded out the set teeth with the nail set. So just put the board, put the saw sideways on a softwood board, took a nail set and tapped each tooth. And I set it that way to oh, something that I felt was appropriate. And using this saw here, I found out that I think I'm a little bit light on the set now. Um, oh, so it was I could feel the plate binding. Right. But it also gave me a super straight cut, except for where the grain was splitting on me. So um, I'll probably go back and I'll set the teeth a little bit more. Right. But just the timbre of the saw seemed to growl a little bit, which is usually indicative of a saw that needs to be just touched up a little bit. But then again, your joiner plane okay. made an awful lot of noise too, so maybe it's just the acoustics in that shop. That's, okay. that's my guess, yeah. Yeah, yeah it could be the microphone. Right. Um, yeah. Um, I'm sitting right in front of the computer right now, and um, I was back about five feet, and I hadn't changed my microphone in. According to you, Shannon, is still picking up my, my voice well, so um, I'm oh, not yeah. sure what that yeah, really means. Yeah. Um, here's Stop. my uh, my dovetails, by the way. I don't know. Let's see. Will I show up? A little gappy. Okay. You should, you should have done, like, uh, two different contrasting woods, walnut and poplar or something, so we could see them better. God, you're picky. <laughs> <laughs> Again, it was what was in my scrap pile. Yeah. <laughs> now, that's, so, that's usually smart because then you, uh, you, uh, the dark wood hides the gaps. Yes. Right. So, Scott, how do you rate your performance? Did, is that a pretty good joint? It was hard for us to tell. Um, I'm not happy with it. Okay. And there's, a good, Shannon, uh, there's a good two, maybe three card gap. Okay. Right there. Um, at least a one card, two card gap there. Mm -hmm. 
and no, it's, it's not set and tight. Yeah, it's not too bad. Okay. Yeah. Now, the way they score this is they time your actual time. And correct me if I'm wrong, Shannon, but it's a 30-second penalty for each card. I honestly don't remember. Probably. It's a 30-second 30, yeah. or a one-minute penalty per card. So it's really in your best interest to spend the extra time to tune up your joint to get it tighter fitting. Yeah, yeah, it's definitely not... Next a couple seconds you're going to spend to, to pair yeah. something. Yeah. 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 And if you watch the video that I posted on my blog there, I tried to um, cut everything long and then peen it to close all the gaps. And that ended up splitting my board, but no. the, it, was, it was a good attempt. That's my tactic, too, because it's pine. So yeah. you, know, you, you just line beat it and just bang yeah. that sucker together. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Well, so, yeah. How how did Scott do time wise? Did we did, you did we check when he finished? I had about uh, six minutes of trying to reconnect to the internet internet in there too. So. Okay. Uh, okay. Yeah, I'm sure it's terrible. That's the first dovetail joint I've cut in. Oh, a year. Oh yeah. Maybe not quite a year. I'm trying to remember. What, yeah. Yeah, it's been a, it's been at least a year since the last time I cut dovetails. So I haven't taught a class on it in, in forever, so. Hmm. Like okay. riding a bike. Never forget. All right. Well, I'll uh, I'll bore a hole now. Okay. Why do you got to be so boring? Huh. Yeah. See, someone right. had to say it. Mm-hmm. So, um, Scott, I got an email from Juan, who is going to be our guest uh, next week for talking about planes and yeah. working in America. And he he says he can't make it next week. Um, yeah. Now I guess that opens up an opportunity, Shannon. Do you want to come back next week and then do more of this? Uh, that would be a no because it's my <laughs> okay. anniversary next week. Oh right, right, yes. Okay. All right. Definitely not a good idea. <laughs> so it looks like it will be a regular wood chat next week. Now. Were there other, what other events do we have to do? A Morrison Tenon was one of them, right? Right. Okay, and then boring a hole, shooting an edge, ripping. So just the tenon is left, and then we will have covered them all on the show tonight. What's the, uh, what kind of tenon joint? Yeah, what's, what's the requirement? Is it just cutting a tenon, and then it has yeah. to fit their mortars? Yeah, and that's what's really easy, is it's, it's just, it's a half-inch thick tenon. Okay. So you don't even have to deal with the mortise. You just have to now. I mean, the jig that they score it with essentially is an open mortise, so they can right. stick playing cards in. But yeah, that's all you have to do is cut that, uh, cut that actual tenon. I cut a half inch tenon in the mat. Sure. Okay. I'll cut the mortise. So um, in case you couldn't see it earlier, that's a spoon bit. Um, yeah. And these are um, these are this is a, a modern manufacturer. The the um, Clecon. What are they called? They're from England. Um, you have to do Clifton. a little bit of, um, yeah. uh, what do you call it, modification on them. They mm. come a little bull-nosed from the factory. So um, I grind back the, the tip a mm. little bit, so it's, it's kind of got more of a, of a uh, thumbnail like shape acute, to it. And then I or grind an the acute angle? down okay. at the front. Okay, um, so you're giving it more clearance on the back, right? Yeah. Yeah, and you get a little bit more ability to steer. A lot of times this bevel, too, is, is too steep of a bevel, and you really want it to be more of a knife edge, so you've got to do a little bit of honing on the inside to turn that into a knife edge a little bit. Um, I don't know exactly the diameter mm -hmm. hole that they're going to have us cut. Uh, this is a 7 16 bit. Um, they don't, I mean, they're not huge bits. This is a 5 8 bit. That's generally about the biggest that I've really ever seen. Um, so... Just for the interest okay. of, of ease, I'm going to use a 7 16th and my um, my little 6 inch swing brace here. So let me. Okay. You guys want extreme close up or do you want to be able to see the brace in action? I think watching, watching the whole. Okay. I was or whatever. It. <laughs> or Chris. Probably better. <laughs> do you have I any tips? I agree with you, Chris. That's all I sure. want. Do you have any tips, Shannon, for using the spoon bit? Because a lot of us have never. Actually, used one before. Yeah, it is. Um, well, in terms of actually using it on a project, it's one of those things where let me grab a scratch all here. 
If you were to say have you know an awl and you've marked your hole that you need to drill, you don't want to take the spoon bit and drop it right on the hole. You actually want to step a little bit away from that bit, from that hole rather. And uh, kind of like I was trying to say earlier, is I will go one direction about 180 degrees, and I'll go back and go the other direction 180 degrees. And what that does is cut a little divot. Okay. Jeez. Yep. See, there's that little divot, and now the nose of the bit just drops in and settles right in there. Okay. Now, what happens if you do one whole rotation in one direction? Um, it may have a tendency to walk on you, but unless you're drilling a precise hole, you probably won't mm -hmm. notice it. Um, okay. this, is, this is just the technique I know to locate. If I know, I definitely want my hole right there. But, you know, mm -hmm. I wouldn't do this in the event because it doesn't really matter where the hole goes. I would just drop it in and just start boring. And it will create a, a little wow. divot, a little nose divot, really quite quickly. Um, but if, if I were to say make like mark a crosshair on here, I would see that it probably wandered ever so slightly off that. Mm -hmm. So if it is a precision thing, that's just a little tip to stay there, um, to stay on that line. Again, the big difference from the Jennings pattern or Irwin pattern twist augers is this doesn't have a lead screw, so it won't pull itself in like you know you may be used to so you do have to apply some pressure down on the pad mm -hmm. and cut really pretty fast mm. and they create this kind of groovy little bullet shaped shaving and I'm through it actually wow. makes a pretty clean exit hole but you're not judged on that at all either they don't mm. care what the exit mm -hmm. hole looks like um, essentially the judging mechanism is a uh, it's a dowel that has like a ring around it. So when they stick the dowel in the hole, they can the ring meets up flush against the wood, and they can stick playing cards to determine, you know, are there any gaps or anything. The cool thing I think about spoon bits is the fact that you can steer them. That's why chair makers like them so much, because if you're working at say a real high angle, I can start. You always start perpendicular to the wood. But then I can like lean down and work at ridiculously low angles. Um, you could actually right. do pocket holes, I guess, if you wanted, or something like this. Really hard to do without the board being supported. But I can drop way down here. I'm probably at 45 degrees, maybe lower than that, mm -hmm. and work right at that angle because of the fact oh. that this spoon shape on the end allows you to steer in which direction. Um, but, the, you know, as far as tips go, to staying perfectly straight, the best way I know to stay perfectly straight is to actually put my forehead on the pad itself, but okay. that's kind of awkward. Then you're, looking, you're looking straight down the, right. down the length of the exactly. bit. So I would sit and kind of I can get this in frame. I would sit a little bit on the, other the board way. Okay. and then put your forehead down like that. Mm -hmm. I don't know if you can see that. Yeah. Yep, yep, we can see that. And essentially I can sight right down there and see. The problem is you can't put a lot of pressure down that way. It's hard on your neck. If <laughs> you're pushing with your neck, and it gets to be very, very <laughs> sore. So um, yeah. this is a thing where when you've got a lead screw that's doing most of the work pulling it through, that it works pretty well. Mm -hmm. So I've never actually seen anybody do that in 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 competition though, because it's it's silly looking, and I guess people are embarrassed. I don't know. Yeah. So what I do is I put it, my shoulder right on the pad, mm -hmm. and I'm out over it a little bit more, but I got I've got a better feel. I can now sight back along the bit. And I can see if I'm square from side to side. And then I can tilt my head a little bit around and I can see if I'm square the other direction. And you can generally get a pretty good feel. Uh, 
here you are. Just by kind of sliding your head back and forth like that. Right. You can see how fast they bore. They're really very quick. Yes. And Not you talked funny. about being able to make an adjustment on the fly. Is that simply by continuing to rotate the brace and tilting it to one direction? Yep, exactly. Okay. Because it just slides around on that spoon, that bull nose tip, um, it cool. allows you to, to make that rotation. Whereas, okay. you know, something like a, a Jennings bit, you know, first of all, you've got a weight screw mm. that is engaged okay. and pulling it in. So if you tilt that angle, you're actually going to strip the threads and it won't work. Mm -hmm. The spurs mm -hmm. on the side that cut the diameter get in the way a lot of times, and if the spur gets in the way, it actually lifts the cutting lip out of the out of the work. So generally, once mm. you get these started, they tend to stay on track. You can tweak yeah. them ever so slightly to the left or right or whatever, but they pretty much bore a straight hole. Mm. Um, this guy, you've got this little wheelbase down here that you can rotate all around in, and it's essentially you okay. know, the same profile to the wood all the way throughout the rotation. Makes them very, very <laughs> versatile, very agile. It's one of the reasons the chair makers like them. Right. Do you think that the motion of correcting uh, the path of the hole with the spoon bit is similar to correcting the path with a handsaw? Say that again? Um, the, do you think that the method used to correct the path of a hole being drilled by the spoon bit is similar to the method you used to co correct a path of a handsaw? Um, Just kind of keep going, but gradually nudge it over, if you will. I don't think you have to be quite so careful with the spoon. Okay. Um, because okay. Uh, the, the best word I can think of is wheelbase. Because that wheelbase is so tight, you can turn on a dime with it. So you can make that correction right away. Um, uh, when working with like a bow saw or something, and you're cutting curves or fret saw or coping saw, it's always a good idea to be sawing while you make the curve because yeah. that way the, tooth, the teeth are not binding. Because that spoon bit presents a, a, you know, a uniform cutting edge throughout the rotation, you can turn right away. You don't really have to do it gradually at all. Right. Um, right. When I was cutting that, here, I'll go to the bigger one. When I was cutting that low angle hole, all I did was work vertically just to get the little divot in the wood, and then I can immediately mm. drop down to a lower angle. Okay. And start bore. Um, you don't have so the other to, difference uh, I'm... do it slowly or whatever. Um, mm -hmm. I yeah. would say yeah. with a Jennings bed or a twist auger, you can't alter the, the trajectory too much, but that would be more of a gentle thing so you don't uh, strip the threads mm -hmm. you've created at the bottom. Right. This doesn't right. have them, so no need to be uh, subtle when you change trajectory. And I guess another factor is because the entire edge of the bit cuts, not just the tip. Absolutely, absolutely. And, mm -hmm. and for that matter, the cutting edge doesn't interfere with the rotation. Like the spurs that mm -hmm. cut the actual sidewalls of the twist auger, they will interfere mm -hmm. if you change the angle, and it actually lifts the cutting lip out of the cut. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, those are for straight holes. These are for crazy holes. How are you doing over there, Scott? Uh, good. I was just waiting. <laughs> waiting? Just hanging. I cut. Did you cut get your, three, your tendon cut? Leaf. Did you already cut your uh, your hole? I, I missed it. I was laying this out. Actually, no, I, I didn't. I got uh, I got excited and kept going. And, and cut, so. All right, I can cut. Okay. He built a plane while we were talking. <laughs> um, okay. You want me to chop a mortar so it'll be noisy? Yeah, I wouldn't bother. Yeah. So if you missed it early in the show, um, Scott cut a dovetail cut a dovetail with two pins as per regulations for the hand to Olympics. Um, I ripped a board and jointed an edge. Uh, Shannon started us off by cross-cutting a board. And um, 
And then he bored a hole, and right now Scott is sawing a tenon. So these are the events that you can compete in for the Hand Tool Olympics at Woodworking America. There are some specific dimensions to that tenon. I just know that I think it's a half inch thick cheek. I mean, it doesn't really matter, obviously. Um, <laughs> Not happy with how much my life moving on. So is this judge straight off the cut? Yeah. Okay. They don't give you a chisel would, or anything to uh, to mess with. I would fail miserably. Um, uh oh. This this side of my cut's great. This side I I. Uh, hmm. see. Here, I'll color in the excess. Tenon. Yay, tenon. So basically, this uh, that tenon would split the the mortise. I've got a bit of a wedge going. So if I can clean it up with with my router plane, I'll be all set. <laughs> I think I'm pretty good here. I can see a little bit of my knife line right there, but I've and a little bit of the knife line right there, but I bet you I could hammer that home. Cool. Pretty good across the thickness, too. Of course, I'm using nice soft right. cotton, too, so it makes things real easy. There we go. That's it. I'm thinking about cutting a... Hey, I've got that same... Oh. So with all that uh, Same which. talking and chatting and all that stuff, it's uh, been, what, an hour and 15? Actually, we got started a little late, so. Well, yeah, one hour exactly. Yeah. We got six events done. It doesn't take long, especially if you don't take so long to cut the dovetail like Scott. Yeah, don't do what I did. Yeah. <laughs> yes. And... Don't do what I did either. Mine, well, I don't know. That the whole peening thing sounded like, sounded like a good idea, but it didn't quite fly. <laughs> I mean, there's no question that trying to get the joint to fit as good as you can off the saw will save you time. So slow yes. down and, and focus on your saw cuts. And, um, yep. you know, the minute you try to pull out the chisel and fix something is the minute gaps happen, in my experience anyway. Um, you know, the fact that they provide a fret saw for you now makes things real easy because you can just drop your chisel kind of right in the line and pare down. And if necessary, you know, they can't see the gap inside. So if you want to undercut a little in there to make sure that it comes together, I mean, I do that on pretty much all of my joints now. Um, mm -hmm. it, that's great because those gaps are hidden and they certainly don't compromise any strength. You're just talking about ingrain inside there. Questions? I have one thing. Pay attention to the chat room. I don't even have it up. Yep. Yeah, I'm, I'm not sure. Um. So, in the sawing events, that's uh, 
cutting tenons, dovetails, and um, the ripping and cross cutting as well. Those those are the events where your your sawing skills are really going to be tested. And a little exercise I like to do to practice is I take a board, preferably a square cut board, not like this one here. And I take my square and I'll draw a series of lines on it, moving across the board. And I'll saw down until my back saw bottoms out or close to there. And I try and make them as straight, following the lines as possible. And then once I get used to that, being able to follow the line exactly straight, I'll try and put them closer and closer together. Uh -huh. So that, by creating a, a really fine finger between the two, you're really forcing yourself to be absolutely straight. Because if you wander off that line, you're going to take off the finger next to it. Right. And that evolved into doing uh, these here, uh, finger joint, uh, saw curve finger joints. Nice. So that's what, I, that's what I do for fun at the demos. It's a pretty good <laughs> exercise and fun, but um, you get, you get uh, it's a little bit better practice to do a longer cut. When you only go in a quarter or a half inch, it's easy to get a joint, but you don't have to deal with the same amount of uh, precision from your saw. Right, yeah. I mean, that's, and on the big ones, I mean, that's the same thing that I tell um, my hand tool school members. Lay out 10 to 20 lines on a board and saw them. Um, you'd be surprised how much your sawing can yep. improve with 10 yep. consecutive 24-inch cuts. I mean, you'll be panting, too, a little bit. But um, especially if you take time in between each cut to hit it with a square and see where did I go mm -hmm. off, and mm -hmm. you eventually get to the point where, oh, I know I'm off plumb now. You can feel it. You build yep. up muscle memory. And mm -hmm. then you verify with a square, and you say, yeah, I felt out of plumb there, and I am, in fact, out of plumb. So then you just correct that in your next one or try to correct it. By the time you get to your 10th cut, you're sawing dead on the line and perfectly plumb. It really doesn't take that much, assuming you have a well-tuned saw. If your set's all off, then it's not going to follow the line no matter what you do. Yes. 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 Sawing is the one thing where I think it's okay to blame the tool if it goes wrong, because a lot of times that's the problem. Um, you know, If the saw is tuned well, it wants to cut straight. And unless you've got you know, ridiculous body mechanic issues, it's going to cut straight on you. Mm -hmm. That's right. That's right. So let the saw don't don't try and control the saw. Just let the saw run straight. Be the saw. Be the and saw. Then. And you want to be in line too. You want your arm in line with your saw stroke. You don't want to be holding the saw at an angle like this and coming in like this. You want, it, you want your saw in line with your arm. That'll help you saw straight as well. Oh, absolutely. Um, that's where your body gets in the way and starts sawing. You know, mm -hmm. out, out of alignment. Um, I think uh, a properly sized saw bench will go a long way to that too. If you're not hunched over um, and you've got the room for your body to kind of move about and be flexible, you know, you can keep it in line real easily because I'm not down like this. And yeah, it's 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 basically just getting your body out of the way more than anything mm -hmm. else. Yeah. So, Sh Shannon and Scott, you'll both be at the, at Woodworking America this year, right? Yep. Yes, sir. And will you both be doing the Olympics? Oh, yeah. I probably won't be. I'll, I'm guessing I'll be locked in my booth the entire time. <laughs> yeah. I managed to get away. When I had a booth a couple years ago, I managed to get away. I didn't do all of the events, but I did, um, I did the dovetailing one. I did the sawing events, and I think that's all I had time for. But uh, yeah. if necessary, Scott, I'll mine the booth. And you can go compete. I'll I'll take you up on that. I might give away a few planes while you're gone, but Oh, well, you know. Cost of doing business. <laughs> It'll be for a good cause. <laughs> Whoever whines the most gets a free plane of the Scott Me food. Oh great. <laughs> <laughs> but I need yeah. one. <laughs> yeah, um Janet's bag might be a, a heavier by six pounds when he goes back. <laughs> Scott, are you going to um, you got any new things to uh, to unveil this year? Um, I'll have the new version of my mallet with the uh, resin infused head and uh, hickory handles. Oh, cool! It, it it will look the same, but it'll be a little bit nicer and and uh, work a little nicer. So, oh. um, yeah, and it'll look the same 
shape wise. Obviously, it won't look the same as the lignum, but um, other than that, I mean, I'll have the 22 inch and uh, 28 inch joiners at the show. I only had the 36 inch last year, um, and I I just realized today that I meant to make another uh, 36 inch joiner. And I forgot to, <laughs> so so I don't have enough time to get one made. So I'm I'm cutting it close enough, getting everything done that I got to get done. So so I'll I'll probably bring my Sapili that's got the uh, the old version of the the holding. Um, it's just a fatter the, the grip grip part. Grip, yeah. But uh, so I, are you like the, are you going to have planes for sale there? Yeah, I will have some planes for sale. I'm gonna have a couple awesome. twenty-two inch joiners, a, a, at least one thirty-six inch or twenty-eight inch joiner. Uh, I'll have a couple smoothers. Awesome. Uh, Twelve inch jack. I might have a, a sixteen inch jack too. I'm, I I don't know if it'll be sellable or not. I might sell one as a blemish actually, but um, I will have a discount on all 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 planes sold at the show and orders placed at the show. So. Wow, that's very generous of you, Scott. Yep. Big fan of those jack points. I think they're awesome. Yeah, you have to try the twelve inch jack at the at the show. I twelve inch jack. Yeah, just yeah. uh I've got the box here. Oh. Hmm. That was close. I, love I almost pulled my computer up. This thing yeah. is absolutely wonderful. It's um this this lathe behind me is made entirely out of Heavily, heavily figured sapile, and um, it, it played relatively well. But man, I pulled out that the the jack and see if you guys can see some of that. Oh yeah, that. yeah, I you saw some that of that figure. That's wow. like nuts. That is that is pretty. Perfectly smooth, using mm -hmm. this guy right there. Works like a dream. It's awesome. Straight <laughs> off the tool. That's and beautiful. You and you, it. And you've got the uh, yours eighteen long. How long did I make that one? I don't remember. Uh, sure. I don't know. <laughs> it's, uh, seventeen inches, actually. Okay. It's the so special it's in between. limited edition seventeen inch. Yeah, it might be the only one made. Um, it's an eighteen inch blade. This is the without my the blade and everything in it, but this is a twelve inch version of the jack, mm. which I use. <laughs> the 12-inch more than I use the longer one, um, but I'm always doing smaller stuff with planes, so yeah. um, I use that one all the time. No, I, I, could, I could see that being coming in handy. Like, the, the smoother I have, you know, it's a great size, but obviously it's set so finely, it, you know, it only comes out for polishing-type tasks and such. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But, um, yeah, I see the block plane on the back, on the, your bench there. Yeah. Now that one gets used quite a bit too. Something about that works better on the on um, like when I've got a really wide ingrain surface, like some of the big timbers I was working on back here. It uh, cleans up those wider swaths of ingrain much better than anything else I have. Okay. I why that is? Mm -hmm. huh, interesting. It, and it may just be the way I hold it. I've got more stability in it, you know, because yeah. You know, a plane will tend to chatter on that tough end grain, and it may just be a, a body mechanic issue. Yeah, um, you know, it kind of forces more of your palm onto the onto the plane. I think, at least yeah. in, in my use of them. So it's definitely a lot more comfortable to hold than I love it. The typical Stanley Lee Nielsen pattern. Yeah. Yeah, I'm, and this sounds cheesy because I sell them, but I'm I'm definitely addicted to my own planes. So. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I, uh, I will have a couple of the resin-infused uh, tiger maple, and uh, I think I'll do African blackwood um, combo on the, the black planes. So I've got the bodies ready to go there. And, um, so I'm hoping to to uh, get more people turned on to the resin infusing for the black planes and for the mallet heads. So. It, it makes an awesome block plane. Um, mm -hmm. It ad adds even more heft than the one you've got there, Shannon, yeah. and a lot of stability. So, but for uh, people that do a lot of, what's I've that? Got a few marks in the sole of mine. This one's apple. Yeah. Um, there's a few marks from uh, cutting chamfers. 
yep. on like freshly jointed edges, that razor sharp edge on hard, namely hard sapili. Yep. And I've got a few little lines showing up in the sole here. I mean, it's certainly not anything that affects how the plane works, but I could see yeah. where that resin would, would help that a little bit. And that's exactly why I did it. Um, uh, Fred West, you know Fred, Chris. Do you know Fred, Shannon? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, he contacted me about that, and, and he said the same thing. He said it didn't affect usage, but he was concerned about you know the lines. From, if you do a lot of chamfers that do get marked up on the soles of the block plane, and so I got thinking about it and looking at my uh, my blue spruce mallet, which has seen lots of use but doesn't look like it's been used a day. And uh, so I experimented with it, and it, it works fantastic for those block planes. So I, all the pieces get um, get infused. I rip the block, infuse the pieces, and then clean it up, and adds. A significant amount of weight and then just toughness and durability to it. So, you know, speaking of mallets, um, this is uh, made by Shenandoah Tool Works. They're going to be at the at Woodworking America this year. This is actually started by um, one of my hand tool school members. And oh, nice! Teams. And <laughs> wow. these are, I mean, they're really, I mean, they're meant for anything. But I think of them as carving mallets more than anything else. <laughs> it's awesome. I mean, I've only had it. Uh, Norm came to the lumberyard to pick up some. Um, some material the other day, and he brought this to me and said, you know, try it out and, and you know, let me know what you think at, at WIA. And I've done um, a little bit of carving with it. I actually put it through its paces and did some uh, mortises with it. Really, just beat the hell out of it. It's a, uh, I didn't beat this up, but I beat the hell out of my wood with it. And um, you know, it, it, I, I've had a hesitation of using a steel head before on wooden tools, but um, oh. No problems. I don't know whether that's one of those myths or what. Um, I mean, I mm. suppose prolonged banging will probably do something to it, but for the light work that I use this for for carving, I don't think I'm going to damage any any tools mm. with it. But uh, I like it. It's a, it's a very ergonomic, and you can kind of grip way up on it and real light taps. It's really good for carving. <laughs> so nice. They'll be at the show. This is the one-pound version. They have a one-and-a-half-pound version as well. Next so I have to ask Shannon, um, since Garth is one of your hand tool school members and he started Time Warp with me, how many of your students have started a business as a result of learning what you're teaching them? Well, I mean, there's there's quite a few of them that have furniture businesses. You know, okay. um, I think uh, Norm and, and Garth and I mean, they're, they're the only tool makers I know of. Well, I mean, Mark Harrell is a member. Scott Meek is a member. Um, but they were already tool makers before they became members. So, mm -hmm. um, membership has made us better tool makers. Yeah, I'm gonna go with that. Sounds good. <laughs> the reason Scott McCann planes cut so well is because he's a hand tool school member. That is true. That is true. <laughs> wow. That's shitty marketing right there. <laughs> um, there's probably 30 or 40 of them that are actual professional furniture makers now. Wow. I mean, that's a, do you know what that number? Do you know how many of them? Um, you know, none of them are fully 100% hand tools. I mean, I don't know any professional, yeah. maybe other than Tom Fidgen, who does it 100% by hand. Mm -hmm. um, you know, everybody's got a planer or probably a joiner in their back pocket, but large majority of them do all their joinery and all the the steps after milling entirely by hand. Yeah. Um, wow. We're here to stay, man. We're not oh. going anywhere. Yeah. Um, yeah. So you can see Scott Scott Meeks's planes. Scott Meeks planes at Woodworking America. And if I get my act together, um, you'll see some time warp planes there as well at his booth. Um, I have a box that's empty that needs to be filled up and mailed off in your direction, Scott. Yes, definitely. Cool. Definitely. So, uh, yeah, I I will not be at the show, so we won't have any dogs Parker. at the show either this year. Yeah. yeah. But um, hope to make it next year. Got one of those too. Excellent bench dogs. There's yes, a couple, those are a couple still... of those sitting over there on my bench. I got all kinds of swag. It's awesome. <laughs> yeah. So. Well, I'll tell you what, Chris. If you can get a couple of those time warp planes, um, you're gonna try to get them to Scott, right, to show up at the yep. booth. Yep. Um, I'll I'll cut some moldings with them while we're there, unless you want to, Scott. Okay. I'm... 
But, uh, I'm I'm not familiar enough with uh, molding planes, so I will I defer to you on that. Okay. So much fun! I'd happy. I'll I'll cut some moldings. You get them there. In fact, what I'll do, Chris, is I'll bring my set, just in case. Okay. Um, yeah. I've got a couple moldings. Right now, yeah, you've got the cherry ones, the original ones. I do. Yes. That's something we we never actually talked about. Um, the that figure and that cherry was just unbelievable. We could have marketed it, but we had them all pre-sold, so it didn't really matter. <laughs> and oh, I don't. Do you, do you have them handy, Shannon? Yeah. It's like a similar grain. It's like as impressive, I think, as his lathe. Just amazing figure on the side of that cherry when I ripped when I opened it up. I didn't know what I was getting into. I never really thought of mine as being horribly figured, but uh, uh, some of them. Maybe you got the. Um, you should have got the production. Maybe maybe yours came pre-production yeah, before we yeah, got that right, stuff. You're right. Okay. There's a fair amount of uh, of curl. I mean, this is the. Yeah, the I can pick it up in the camera. There's a. Kind of hard to catch the light, but there's a good amount of curl yeah. on the side yeah. there. This one has a fair amount of curl to it as well. I mean, it's not it's not a tiger stripe or anything like that, but there's a. I mean, we're also looking at the radial face too. But. Yeah. That was a lot of fun opening up the board and discovering that for me. Yeah. I thought I was just buying some quarter on cherry. And open up, wow. They are well used. Oh. I'll tell you that much. Well, Maybe that's, that's why good. the figure that's doesn't come out very much because there's lots of handprints on these. <laughs> <laughs> Are the yeah. soles holding up well? Have you had to tune them up? No, no problems. Oh, excellent. They're excellent. Um, perfectly fine. And for that matter, um, I'm of the hmm. school that starts all of my rabbits just off of a knife line. So I, yep. I, I bear the, the sharp edge in the knife line, and the, uh, the corner has not broken down one bit. So, you know, traditionally it just would be boxed with, you know, box wood or persimmon, so it's more durable. And this is just, there's no boxing here. And... I mean, it's it's not rounded over at all. I mean, it still tracks right in, in a gauge line and starts your rabbit with it. So perfect. Now <laughs> I'm convinced that um, on all all wood planes, no matter what what type, most any wear and tear on the sole of a wood plane isn't coming from use. It's coming from misuse. Yeah. Or it's coming from yeah. um, uh, like someone that that doesn't understand how to true a sole like of a bench plane and they're just going to town taking off more material than they need to mm -hmm. is, is why you get too much wear on a plane so well and I mean that's is it? the little lines I have in the bottom of this apple smoother essentially that's abuse I'm putting this you know on the sharp corner of a wood that's three times harder than apple <laughs> it's bound mm. to it I mean and you can't even call it a groove it's more of like an indentation yeah um, Okay. And hmm. it's only ahead of the blade, you know, because that's where I'm, I'm right. bearing down a little bit. And it was hmm. one of those things where I knew when I did it, and I was like, oh, shoot. And I went and grabbed the Veritas plane hmm. and switched to it <laughs> because I knew, you know, the, the Janka hardness of Sapili is, is much, much higher than that of Apple. So, you know, it's bound to happen. Yep. <laughs> I'm just looking at my steel planes right now, and I see marks on the soles of them as well and I've never actually figured out what they're from. They're not from hitting nails and screws. Does anyone have an ex explanation for that? Um, I don't know. Mineral of deposits off. in a piece of wood? Yeah. I mean it, it could even be the same type of thing. I mean if you think about it, you know, if you're if you're working on a sharp jointed edge, you know, that perfect 90 degree yeah. intersection, the one that you like slice your finger open on when you run it on, it's something like hard maple. Um, we're talking pounds per square inch. Well, you know, you've got yeah. such a huge amount of force into that, that sharp corner. Um, whether you're actually marking an iron sole, a seal sole, or, you know, actually denting it or just marking it could be, you know, something altogether. You know, I don't know if you can like run yeah. your finger over it and feel, is there actually a deformation there, or did it just kind of discolor it a little bit? Well, so, it could yeah. be, too. I know you know I work with a lot of woods that have a, a high silica content, yeah. uh, like mesquite or, or some of the exotics mm -hmm. or whatever, and 
if that silica can break down a razor sharp edge of a blade, there's no yeah. reason why I can't put a, a slight, you know, microscopic scratch in the in the freshly polished bot sole of a plane. So metal body. Plane. Right. W whether it be yeah, whether it be metal cast iron, which is quite soft, or wooden. Yeah. Yeah, I ran into a little bit of that. My um, spring pole lathe, which is over there, um, the rails are all out of teak, and oh, the yeah. top is all made out of teak as well. Mm. So it, uh, wow. it screwed with a few things, especially the beaded edge, uh, beaded profile I put on the edge. It uh, messed with my uh, three-eighths inch beading plane just a wee bit. I had to chew up the sole mm. after that. <laughs> oh well, I knew it was going to happen, but. Mm -hmm. I sacrificed for the art of teak <laughs> and maple. Yeah, teak is brutal. Yeah. Teak, uh, African blackwood. African blackwood isn't it's necessarily brutal on. No, it is brutal on cutting cutting edges. It's just it's hard. It's just too hard. I yeah. I love how it looks, so I'll never get rid of it as an option. Yeah. It looks so awesome with with mesquite, mm -hmm. but it. It's miserable. <laughs> so yeah, the the teak for uh, the uh, Highland Plains hasn't been real uh, real fun uh, on cutting edges either. So have you, know, you used up? I found that teak is actually quite pleasant to work. I mean, it's hard on your yeah, own, but yeah. I mean, it it planes really well. It's oh yeah, 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 yeah. That's right. Um, yeah. <laughs> it's actually quite easy to work, um, which <laughs> is not real friendly to cutting edges because the high right. silica. Yeah. Have either of you worked with just grain structure? It works so well. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. Have either of you worked with black locust? Yeah. I have not. I, I keep having people I, tell me that I need to get some locust. Yeah, or some I, love, I love that material. Um, it's it's got a real open grain structure, and it's it takes a an amazing polish. Um, I've done a few sculptures out of it, and you can get it to such a high level of finish. It almost glows. Interesting. And I can see that set off against the black, the blackwood, African blackwood. Yeah. It's kind of like a golden color. Yeah, there's a lot of locusts oh, around here, right? Now, but I just, I had a turning blank that I just did something with it. Okay. So. Okay. Um, what do you, what are your guys' opinion on this as a, as a uh, hand plane wood? I think it'd be great. Actually, I was temp when when I had when I was looking at materials to make the planes with. That was one of the options that I had, and um, ultimately we didn't choose it. I can't remember exactly why, but um, I think it, I think it'd be a great wood for hand planes, and I should actually make one, make a hand plane with it. I can't imagine it'd be you know any different aesthetically than the white oak ones you've done. That's that was my thought. Oh, yeah. different. Yeah, I mean it's harder certainly, but uh, color, right? I mean, white oak, black locusts. <laughs> I mean, the grain structure is very, very yeah. similar. In fact, some people might even mistake it for that. Yeah. Mm. Yeah, it's a uh, extremely hard though. Good to know. Yeah, I'll have to, I'll have to grab yeah. a piece of that and make a, a couple of custom planes for the ready to, ready to ship site. So. Yeah, I should make one of the black locusts. That's. That'll, that'll make it to my list though. Although I don't need many more planes. Um. I want to I want to ask you both a question. How many bench planes? When I say bench planes, I mean low angle planes and standard angle planes, not joinery planes, but just for surfacing lumber. How many do you have that you regularly use? Set up for various tasks, I guess. Let's see. Got a four plane that I use all the time. Got a joiner plane. Um. This meat jack plane, I use that constantly, kind of an in-between. Um, smoother, number four. And then I've got a number three that I use quite a bit as well. It's kind of a perfect sweet spot size for smaller project parts. Um, I think that's it as far as, like, see regular use. I mean, I have a, I have a couple of jack planes. Um, okay. And, you know, depending on the month and the time of year, one is more their favorite than the other. Lately, it's the Scott Meek plane because I've been working with such heavily figured woods. Mm. Um, okay. But, you know, I have an old Stanley uh, number five that gets a fair amount of use, too. 
Was that seven planes? Six planes? <laughs> Six, I think. I saw you counting on your fingers, but I couldn't. How how often uh, do you consider regular <laughs> use? Um, on a weekly basis, or weekly if basis? You're in the shop regularly? Probably uh, probably five planes for me. Five planes. Okay. Uh, twelve twelve inch jack. I've got um, let's see, twelve inch jack. Three smoothers that I that I use for different things, mostly because. I hate sharpening, so I just have three smoothers with sharp blades. Um, you think you would rather build a new plane than sharpen a dull one? Yes. <laughs> That's a cry for help, man. <sighs> no, it's it's not that bad. Um, really, I use two of those smoothers more than the more than the third one. Um, uh, did I say twelve inch check? Yeah, twelve inch check. Um, yeah. The block plane. And the 22-inch joiner, and then the 30 mm. now the 36-inch joiner. So seven that I use regularly, but right now planes that I use periodically, I'm gonna count just all the planes that I use: one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen. <laughs> yeah, fourteen. Are these all wooden planes? Or metal as well. Uh, there's, there's, uh, oh, 15. Yeah. Because there's the rabbiting block plane, too. Um, I have my Linios number four that, that sees use once in a while. Um, I'll use that on the, uh, on the bevel sometimes, mm -hmm. uh, the, the bed angle once in a while, just, okay. Just because it's, it's a little more rigid on that. Um, I don't know. I don't know why. Sometimes I like it, sometimes yeah, I don't. Sure. Um, or, yeah, or the uh, or if it's the only sharp, <laughs> blade, and, you know, and I'm yeah. just too. Uh, yeah, I just get to this point where I, all of a sudden, I have to sharpen everything, and then, then yeah. I'm happy. But yeah. um, and then I've got a number six uh, Wood River that hasn't seen use in mm. who knows how long. So I should probably just yeah. sell it. But. But, I yeah. think I counted. Yeah. That's a lot of planes, Scott. I, I might have an addiction. Yeah. <laughs> how, how about your um, your scrub plane? Do you use that regularly? Oh, yeah, 16. <laughs> oh, yeah. I forgot about that guy. Yeah, add that one for me, too. Shannon's at 7 or 8 or something. So I think I'm at I'm at 8 or 9. Scrub. Oh, if eight. I move it to smaller pieces, the scrub 18, plane... 18, 19. Uh, I, I'm at 18. I forgot the 36-inch joiners. Okay. <laughs> joiners, yeah. Jeez. <laughs> My joiner gets probably the least amount of use. Yeah. Um, oh, really? Yeah, because uh, the, the jack plane seems to be serving that role a little bit more. And I think it may just mm. be up until this, this treadle lay that I built, a lot of the projects that we're building were rather small. You know, small wall hanging cabinet, I built a right. clock and things like that. Yeah. Most of my project parts are around 12 to 18 inches long, and yep. you know, so my jack, my jack is 18, <laughs> and it just it didn't make sense to to grab the the big joiner and do that. So yeah, um, I'm I'm excited, Shannon, for you to try the 22 inch joiner. Me too. Cause you haven't you haven't tried my joiners yet, have you? No, I haven't. I haven't. Yeah, I I'm really excited to see what you think of that uh, at the show because. Um, well, when I had the when I made the 28, I used the 28 all the time. But now that I have the 22, and again because of the the length of work that I normally do, the 22 gets used all the time. So. Yeah, yeah. Um, my most my, my most recent acquisition is the 22 inch uh, Veritas bevel up jointer, and I never really thought I needed it, but I got a good deal on it, so I, I snapped it up, and um, I've been using it a lot actually. Um, that's, that's my. Yeah, that's my largest plane. I've got a number six Stanley that I use as well. Um, I have a Veritas number five and a quarter and a Wood River number five. I use those quite regularly. I have them set up for coarse and fine cuts. Um, my Veritas number four is my all-time favorite plane, my most trusted smoother. Um, that the Burt smoother that I made, the Live Edge one, I haven't. I've used it a bit. Um, 
I'm still quite I'm still tuning it a little bit. The blade doesn't yeah. quite sit right. Um, and then I've got three two scrub planes. I use the wooden one. Um, the other one's a number four, kind of converted, if you will, into a scrub. And uh, my block planes I use a lot, so it's about nine nine planes for me. Yeah. Have either of you guys tried the PMV eleven blades? I have not yet. Um, I want them to make yeah. some some that, that look a little nicer for the the uh, Kronoff style planes. Nicer meaning no holes through it, or um, yeah. I just it, I don't need all the extra yeah extraneous stuff on them. But yeah, you saw um, what I did for mine, right? Yeah, I just, I just stuck it in there, and they're hidden by the wedge. Yeah, you could you should um if you do a blackwood sole, make some blackwood plugs and fill it. That'd be slick. <laughs> huh. There That'd you go. Those, those two adjustment holes for the Norris adjuster, and then that the big kind of diamond-shaped hole you can use to attach your cap iron. I think that'd be That's pretty cool. Yeah, so, we'll see. Scott missed your uh, quarter to midnight yawning over there. Do you, want, do you guys want to wrap it up? Oh, I'm yeah, still I'm going to be down here working for two more hours at least. So uh, okay. <laughs> no, not me. I hey, I do have to. Tomorrow morning. I do have to grab something real quick. Hold on a second. Okay. So we'll, we'll wrap up when Scott gets back. Anything else you want to cover, Shannon? Any shout-outs? Any... Uh, I want to say thank you to the Academy. <laughs> Shout-out to my dog who's lying at my feet. That's about it. I don't know if this is showing up real well on the... On the uh, this is one of Fred West's new planes. Um, the Cody and uh, German oak, German white oak. Okay. okay. Uh, it, the the oak doesn't look tremendously different than than American white oak. Um, it's tighter. Uh, um. Oh, what do you? Yeah. Tighter grain. Tighter. Um, the the quarter on grain quarters. pattern is is tighter, okay. but um. It looks the color's a little bit different, but yeah, you can see the the Bacote for the sole. Mm -hmm. so. You said it's German oak. German oak, Spessart oak. Okay, yeah, yeah, it's just a tighter grain to it. Yep, uh, that's a sweet plane. So Very nice. I gotta I gotta ask him if there will be a couple um, at the show. I've got a. A uh, Spessart Oak and Bacote Smoother, and then and is that Spessart? No, it's just Old Growth White Oak and Bacote uh, thirty or twenty-eight inch joiner that I'll have it at WIA for sale. So cool. Definitely bring, even though it's the older model. Uh, if you can, you've got space. Definitely bring the big joiner. I'd love to try that one. Yeah, I'll bring it. it It'll, I'll just, it'll actually, it's actually a good example of how I've changed um, the grip a little bit, and I can, I can walk people through that. So, And mm -hmm. also this year, I will have a left-handed joiner. It'll be a 22-inch uh, mm -hmm. left-handed joiner, because um, I didn't have one last year. So, Oh, you're a lefty. I forgot. Uh, these days, I'm ambidextrous, because I, uh, <laughs> you know, I have but a left-handed bench here, but at the museum on the weekends, <laughs> we don't have any left-handed benches, so... Yeah, I, uh, I, I switch back and forth all the time now, and it's actually incredibly valuable. I mean, yeah. I've gotten that yes. way with carving yeah. too. I, I have to constantly switch hands, um, <laughs> and you know, I, I have some vintage molding planes that are right hand planes, and I have some left handed molding planes. I have some skew rabbit planes that you've got to switch back and forth. It's just it's yeah. beneficial yeah. to be able to to do that. Um, yeah, how is your hand sawing with your right hand? Um, it's a good question. I don't have to do that very often. I never thought okay. about that. Okay. One, I've been practicing with, with my left hand, and I'm, I'm actually pretty decent. I could do a decent, uh, probably a decent dovetail joint off the stall with my left hand. But one of my dreams is to cut a left cut, use my left hand to cut the pins, my right hand to cut the tails at the same time. <laughs> sure. Why don't you just cut the pins with your right hand and compose a sonnet with your left hand? <laughs> 
Hey, if you can do both of those and get it done in two and a half minutes, then you can uh, put that video up against um, half the time. Uh, yeah. What? Uh, yeah. Cosman. You know, Cosman. I bet you, I'd, I'd be, it'd be an interesting experiment, but I bet your non-dominant hand would saw pretty well because it's yeah. somewhat weak and it would just get out of the way of the saw. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you, 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 I mean, you get a bit, you get a bit of some funky little handle things. things. Um, you might yeah. have some, some. Uh, yeah, I have a point there. Interesting. Yeah, that's gonna be like I'm gonna write a new book. <laughs> your non-dominant hand. I've been trying to plane left-handed a lot more, or not a lot more, but just this week actually, I've been trying to plane left-handed just, just to to mix it up a little bit and. You know, it extend planing times without extending wear out. So. Yeah, yeah. I, th I think I'm fully ambidextrous with hand planes. Yeah. Hand saws I'm getting in there. You do enough work with it, and you just find out that it's just easier. You know, I mean, yeah. you end up on the other side of the bench or something like that, or need to move another direction. It's just nice to switch hands. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. All right. All right. Let's sign off, everybody. And say good night to the crowd. Hasta the bye bye, peeps. <laughs> see you in Cincinnati. <laughs> All right, yes, so definitely stop by and see us. Yeah, okay. so we're signing off for Wood Chat uh, of October 2nd, 2013. I am Chris Wong from Flair Woodworks. Tonight we had Scott Meek of Scott Meek Woodworks and Shannon Rogers of the Hand Tool School and Renaissance Woodworker with us. You can catch both of them at Woodworking in America coming up in a few weeks in Cincinnati. And you can catch me in my shop in Port Moody in a few weeks. See you guys oh, next week. I do want to say uh, one more thing about Woodworking in America. I totally forgot. I meant, meant to say it last week, and I forgot last week too. Um, and I know, Shannon, this goes the same time that you guys are doing the uh, the Wood Talk meetup. So I apologize. But there is a hand plane, uh, hand plane makers roundtable uh, dinner, yes. I guess. Um, Saturday night at 7 p.m. And uh, so, if you get a chance, check that out. That'll that'll be fun too. So. Well, uh, Wood Talk will be at the Keystone Pub starting at six. So come <laughs> by, grab a drink with us. Yeah. We have a place for the entire night. So when you're done with the plane makers dinner, that's when it's going to be real interesting. So we expect Tom Iavino to be three sheets to the wind by probably nine o'clock. So <laughs> you, you guys are going out long. Come to Keystone. I mean. They can't. They can't book a room yeah. twice for an event. So <laughs> we have it until well, basically last call. Um, excellent. Yeah. Well, I'll make yeah. an appearance there yeah. after. Uh, yeah. Unless uh, like Conrad and and the, and Rainey and those guys want to go go out drinking uh, a bunch of plane makers together, then I'll. Unfortunately, sorry to everyone. I'll probably default to that because last year I learned more talking to other plane makers about business than I've. That I've learned in anything else, so um, well, I'll take advantage of. Keystone Pub, we have beer there. There we go. I'll, <laughs> yeah. If I remember correctly, and, it's like um, right across the street from the. Um, is it? From the hotel. Yeah, it's, it's it's like one block okay. over and then one block over, so it's not far at all. All right. Yeah. I'll try. I'll definitely um, try to make an appearance. So. I want to add on to what Scott said. If you're thinking about going to Woodworking in America, but looking at the class list and thinking you can't afford to go to the classes. Go for the marketplace. You can learn, I think, as much in the marketplace talking to the vendors yes. as you can from attending the classes. Yep, absolutely. And absolutely. what admissions? What twelve bucks or something? Or it's cheap. I think it's like seven bucks a day, isn't it? Seven. Okay, sure. I thought it's, it was. It's it's really affordable. Go for the marketplace alone. Even if you don't want to buy anything, just go there to learn, and do from, the hand to Olympics. Yeah, from my experience as a vendor, I do more teaching. There than I do the entire year. I mean, Absolutely. it's just yeah. um, so much so you get into a rhythm. And last year, Frank Klaus came to the bench or came to my my booth, and I was talking to somebody else. And I turned around and here's Frank Kraus, Frank Klaus, Frank Frank Klaus, using the uh, 36 inch joiner. And my first instinct was, oh, let me show you how. Wait, you're Frank Klaus. <laughs> Never mind. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, but yeah, I. I love showing people how to use them, so pick my brain when you're there. I and mean, that, That's what I'm there for. And um, You get all kinds of education for free in the marketplace. Yeah, absolutely. That's right. It's a lot of fun. All right. We are almost at midnight for the East Coast folks. We are going to sign off, and we will see you back here next week for Wood Chat.
See you, everybody. Good night, folks.